Good morning, Robert. How are you? I'm well, and I don't know if you noticed the T-shirt I have on today, but uh, it is the the newer one. You had said to me, when yes. are you getting out of the 2018 one and into the 2023 one? And this is the the new modern version of the uh, of the state championship. Did they not t-shirt. put a date on this one? Yeah, it's got a 2023 in there. You just have to kind of find it. Okay. Oh, I see it. It's up. Yeah. It's lost in the paw print. Yes. A lot so of congratulations that. on that. Yeah. Uh, also, let's welcome in uh, uh, my favorite attorney, Mr. Joe Ferretti. He's my favorite attorney because he's uh, the one in the room that's sitting here. across from me. Joe, good morning to you. <laughs> good morning, Rob. Uh, you are the guy I call, though, whenever I have a question. And that's the problem with being an attorney or a health professional in the family as a friend because people are always milking you for free advice. Uh, who said it was free? <laughs> I, I just haven't gotten around to billing you yet. Uh, I've moved. And, and, and I'm glad you reminded me. I have to get that billing statement together. Yeah, my, my wife is a pharmacist by degree. And in the early years of that, whenever we would go anywhere and people would find that out, they would begin asking her medication questions. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you got that as an attorney. Well, you know, that's part, of the, that's part of the deal. Uh, y- you go to school all those years uh, so that someday you could become a resource for other people. I, I, I don't mind that uh, to an extent. To an extent. <laughs> Right. But uh, you do extensive research for the show. I mean, there are times well, Oh, well, Joe's prepared. Yeah, and beyond prepared. Yeah, he, he does I, a great I job. I admire that. Well, thank you. I, 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 today will not be an example of that. <laughs> <laughs> Just rolled out of bed. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't. I mean, who is this guy? <laughs> <laughs> that is good news for our first guest, by the way. A former Judiciary Chairman of the House, Moore Capito, now a candidate for governor. Moore, good morning to you. Good morning, Rob. Good to be back with you guys. So uh, you're making a, a swing through the state right now because uh, Joe told me he saw your vehicle in the parking lot. It's covered with road salt and snow. Well, I tell you, there is some road salt and snow, believe it or not. I know we got it all throughout West Virginia uh, last week, but uh, that's right. Last uh, Yesterday, actually, we started our day in uh, Tucker County up in the mountains, uh, checking out some of our uh, ski slopes. I'm proud to report that we've got a lot of native West Virginians on the, uh, on the slopes. We got a lot of snow out there at Timberline. We also got a lot of people coming from uh, Virginia and Maryland and Pennsylvania, drawing into the state which is a great way to show off the beauty but i tell you there was a lot of salt and snow we didn't paint it like that you just got to make sure you don't rub up against it on your way out careful yeah that's right be careful hey where are you headed next so we're going to spend the day we got we we got into uh we started our day as i said yesterday in tucker county and then we came over and spent some time in hampshire county yesterday meeting with uh, voters and local leaders there got into uh martinsburg late last night um Spent some time with some folks uh, talking at some of the local restaurants, which is always great, and getting feedback on uh, who's registered to vote uh, in West Virginia. And uh, today we're going to spend time with our Visitors Bureau here in the Eastern Panhandle, which I know is always an exciting thing. You all have so much going on up here, uh, and uh, it's always invigorating to be here and hear those really good stories about not only the business growth that's going on, but the tourism that's going on. So we're going to spend some time today talking about that uh, here in Berkeley County. Uh, we're going to head to Hardy County today, too, and Pendleton County as well. We're also going to be in Grant County. Uh, we've been all over the place, and we're running like the elections tomorrow. We've been doing that for 10 months, and we ain't going to stop. Well, that's a busy schedule. But when you're trying to be governor, you got to see all 55. Well, somebody once said to me, you know what, I signed up for it. So, Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's going the, great. It's in the family. You know what? Um, I'm my own man, uh, and uh, I, I've got a family that's – told me one thing nothing's given to you you got to go earn it and that's exactly what we're doing mm-hmm. all right hey let me ask you your uh, opinion first on something that's relatively recent in the news and that's the party's decision to close its primary uh, critics of it say it goes against what helped grow the party in the state uh, others say with well, the primary purpose of a party is to nominate its own candidates so why would you open the primary well in west virginia we've always had we're a conservative state and we know that uh, in the Republican Party, uh, we are conservatives. Uh, but what we also know is we got a lot of independents in West Virginia that are conservatives. You look at the national sort of dialogue that's going on right now, and I don't really think it fits into the dialogue in West Virginia. Quite frankly, uh, many of the independents in, in this state are Donald Trump voters. And you're talking about close to 300,000 voters that want to cast their ballot for President Trump. And, you know, I think they should probably be able to do that. 
Um, we've always been a party that's grown uh, through, you know, the acquisition of, of new members. Uh, and the way that we do that sometimes transitions from them once, you know, once being Democrats in West Virginia, that Democrat party obviously left a lot of West Virginians. Some of them are still independents, but they're moving towards Republican. And we always want to encourage more and more of them to come to the party. Joe? I know that uh, you have, you have school age children. And I know education has been a big platform issue for you. Uh, we've had a couple surveys done here recently in West Virginia. One came from the teachers union and one was presented, uh, I think, by the State Board of Education recently to the legislature. And they talked about uh, some of the issues plaguing our public schools. Uh, you've talked about the need to empower parents. Uh, and we've, of course, have taken some steps with that with Hope Scholarship. And uh, you've called upon the schools to be a little bit more transparent and work with, with parents. Uh, yet the survey shows, and this was a striking statistic to me, teachers uh, fi at the rate of 5% of teachers surveyed believe that parental involvement is sufficient for the operation of the public schools. As governor, what would be your message to parents to get them vested, to get them interested in our public schools to the point where the teachers feel they're getting the support and the involvement they need to improve our school's performance? Yeah, thanks for the question, Joe. And as you mentioned, I, I'm getting used to the new age. I, ha I have a, uh, an eight and a six-year-old. For the past year, I've been saying eight and five-year-old, but my five-year-old's newly minted as of two days ago as, as a six-year-old. And I think, as I've said before, I think education is the most uh, pressing moral and economic issue that we have in the state right now. And I do say that the biggest thing that we can do to improve our educational system as a whole is to in involve our families. Um, you mentioned these surveys that we're talking about with the educator. I'm a, a product of our public schools here in West Virginia, so I'm deeply passionate about seeing them succeed. One of the ways that we do that is ensuring that our communities are involved. So when we make decisions at the school level, whether it's about curriculum or whether it's about activities at that school, we always want to engage our parents and in some instances our grandparents in what's going on. I think it's all about communication and building relationships. I'm the get it done conservative in this race and I say that because I've been able to take good ideas and turn them into good public policy. The way that you do that is through leadership, by bringing people to the table, eliciting feedback and leading with your ears and listening. I'm a listener. I think we need to bring parents and educators to the table so that we're finding solutions in a collaborative way. We don't want to sort of pit parents versus teachers or administrators versus legislators. This is about bringing people together to find solutions. We all can agree that the education of our children is paramount to the success of this state. The most important thing that we can do as West Virginia is grow. And the way that we grow is by keeping our people here. And if we wanna keep our people here, we have to provide the educational opportunities to do that. It absolutely means involving parents. It absolutely means involving educators, but we need to work together to do it. But, Go ahead, John. Uh, what, what's the string you pull though? I mean, already, if, if the issue is that parents are not yet involved, it's not like they're not welcome, right? They're just not involved. So we can provide all the opportunities in the world, but what's the string that you pull to actually spark that level of involvement? And not at the global level of, of establishing curriculum, but at the, the individual school level to, to get little Johnny's mom and dad to take time with little Johnny. Sure. You, yeah. I mean, I, I get what you're going with that, uh, John, and, and it's a good question. You can't legislate parents to be involved. Right. Um, if, if we could all wave our magic wand, there's no question that we would say every parent's going to be, you know, uh, you know, deeply involved in their children's education. We have to encourage that through the manner in which that we reach out to our parents. We have to encourage it through the way that we do our parent teacher uh, communications. How often are we reaching out to parents? Are we tracking our communication to our parents? So you mentioned the name Johnny. I don't know if that's what they called you as a kid, but uh, and he would he, not stay in his he, seat. And he wouldn't stay in his seat. I've got a little one like that too at home. Um, yeah, but he's sixty-five he, and still does it. Though. That's the he, well, he, well, he's getting antsy about Social Security. We were talking about that earlier. Um, so, but. But how are, we, how are we tracking parental communication? One of the biggest 
issues that's going on in our schools right now uh, is absenteeism. It's chronic absenteeism. And we know that it's happening with a lot of students over and over again. It's the same sort of uh, kids that it's happening to. So what have been our outreach efforts there specifically, and how are we manifesting and tracking those? I'm a big person that believes in metrics. How are we measuring the results of what we're getting? So where are our issues cropping up and with whom are they cropping up with? And what are our outreach efforts? We absolutely know that the, 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 the number one marker of success in education is parental and family involvement. But the strength in West Virginia that we have as a culture and, and, and in the value system that makes us so incredibly unique is that we believe in community. So is it, is it broader than just parents? Is it more community involvement than just specific targeted uh, par parental involvement? If a, uh, uh, a teacher's pay raise bill comes to Governor Moore Capito's desk, let's put yourself in the office right sure. now. You going to sign it? I think we absolutely need to take the opportunities to increase the pay to our teachers. We have teachers that are invested in our students. Um, I've always said that we need to have sort of a three-step process to ensure that our educators are not only uh, invested in what they're doing and passionate about what they're doing, uh, but we need to start with ensuring that they get the tools that they need to succeed. I've talked about this before. I think a critically important bill that we passed last year was the Third Grade Success Act. It requires that we have supplemental professionals in every first, second, and third grade classroom to ensure that our children are meeting that critical marker in third grade of reading to learn. For the first, my daughter's in third grade right now, for the first time she's actually reading to learn. You know, we have to make sure that we're hitting that mark because it's so critical. All of the data shows us that kids that are reading to learn by the, by the third grade have a, an immensely higher chance of succeeding. So we have to hit those markers early on. We have to put supplements in place for teachers to be able to succeed. And then we have to measure success. We have to measure what the metrics are and what the data bear out after we put those, um, those tools in place to succeed. And then we have to compensate appropriately. So if teachers are performing, if they have the tools that they need to succeed, they're meeting metrics and exceeding metrics, we need to compensate them appropriately. What kind of raise are you, are you thinking? Because you're going to see, I believe, two schools of thought coming out uh, that's going to be debated at the legislature. One is another 5% raise or so, which is we, what we've been doing lockstep for, I think, four of the last five years. Mm -hmm. Another proposal that I've seen floated is to have a minimum starting salary of something in the low 40s, around $43,000, dollars $44,000, and then having everybody else bumped up from there, depending on years of service. What do you think is the best approach there? Well, I think we need to do the best we can do. And I will tell you, I'm the only candidate in this race that's given uh, teacher raises and proudly uh, voted for raises for our teachers. Uh, there's no question, especially when you look at an area like we're sitting in right here in Berkeley County. I mean, look at the exodus we've had on teachers. I mean, there are billboards that are, I believe, uh, advertising for higher pay for teachers just to cross over into the next state. Mm -hmm. We can't have our best and brightest leaving us to go to other states to educate their children. We need to be doing everything we can to keep them here. So whether it's a 5% raise or bumping up that minimum, we need to study what the best way to keep our best and brightest here. And I'm always open to that dialogue, but I think we need to continue to keep our eye on it. Would that also include a form of locality pay? There you go. Many people in the Eastern <laughs> Panhandle good, have good uh, asked for that. I don't know how much power the governor has to do that on his own if the legislature won't go along with it, but certainly it's come up against the roadblock in the legislature any time sure. it's been talked about. Yeah, yeah. locality pay has been a, been a, been a large uh, discussion in, in the legislature. I'll tell you, over the past summer, uh, we went on a uh, public safety round tour, uh, roundtable tour throughout the entire state, and one of the things that we really talked about was how do we grow public safety uh, in West Virginia, because I've said in, on the campaign trail, if West Virginia can claim the banner of having the safest communities in the country, we have a real opportunity to grow. When you look at the angst that's going on across the country about uh, the safety, um, whether it's drugs or crime that's going on in some of these other communities, we have a real opportunity here in West Virginia and a sticky proposition to draw people here if we can claim that banner of having the safest communities. But what does that require? That requires having 
better training for our law enforcement. It requires giving law enforcement the tools that they need to succeed. I'm very proud that the Deputy Sheriff's Association has endorsed my candidacy. It's because I've probably had more conversations with law enforcement than anybody else in this race. And what we're hearing from law enforcement is they're having a tough time retaining talent. One of those reasons is locality pay. You look here in the panhandle and somebody that works uh, you know, in one of our local sheriff's offices or works in the city police or municipal police is getting picked off by other states because they're getting higher pay. So how do we solve that? It's absolutely something we need to look at. West Virginia is a unique state in that we have so many border counties right now and we have to look at ways to compete. We just can't avoid it. Do you know if the governor has the power on his or her own to enact locality pay or does it have to go through the legislature? It would have to go through the budgeting process in the legislature to some degree. I figured the judiciary chairman would know that, Joe. (laughs) If, if anybody would know they that, usually don't let me talk on budgeting issues but i stayed well acquainted <laughs> i sat right behind uh chairman chris and he's a uh he's been a big supporter of our campaign and keeps me well posted on the budget how was that hornby guy behaved down there by the way when you were there well that was the biggest thing i was worried about leaving the house that i couldn't keep my eye on you know uh you know hornby down there he got a little out of pocket and started you know mm. voting this way and that imagine and, that uh, but i tell you no i'm kidding mike's a great one down there he's a good representative He's a good friend. Um, he's one of those guys who actually, uh, you know, speaks the truth and uh, believes in growing small business. I and and that's I think what it's about at the end of the day is growing the economy and growing jobs. And Mike's obviously a big proponent of that. John, back on the education thing, we keep talking about throwing more money at an issue, and I think that's a really easy thing for government to do because money is is the the just the, it's the currency of politics. But if we continue to throw money at a fundamentally broken system, mm. and I think we have to declare this to be fundamentally broken, 50 out of 50, it's, it's, it's pretty broken. Does this represent kind of a, a, a crisis of imagination within the, the education system? Do we need to look at, for example, restructuring the State Board of Education uh, so that it's not such a top-down mandate on how we run the education and maybe giving more power to the individual school districts? I think it's a great question. And I agree with you. I think the education system is broken when, for, you know, from start to finish. I spoke about that er, those early metrics that we need to focus on uh, in, in our classroom. But I think it goes further than that. And I think it requires innovation. And let me just say here very, very clearly that I will never just throw money at education. We've been throwing money at education. Throwing money at education is not the answer. It's about being innovative, disrupting the system and creating solutions that provide better pathways for success for our students. I think one of the best ways that we can do that is grow vocational opportunities in our middle schools and in our high schools so that our children are ready for success. Under my administration, we'll have a West Virginia Work Ready program so that every single high school student will be able to do one of three things, pass a military entrance exam, have a vocational skill, or be able to go on to college with a college admissions exam. For far too long, we've been telling students in the state of West Virginia that you have to go to college. We don't tell them what's next. We just say that this is some sort of end goal, but it's not. So we need to start talking to our students when they're in middle school, start lowering the age of getting kids involved in these vocational opportunities. I've spent time after time on the road. We've been between 60 and 70,000 miles on this campaign so far all across the state of West Virginia. We've been in every county and every region. And one of the things that we love to do is visit our Votech schools and our community colleges. And what we're seeing is a higher enrollment. We're seeing a higher level of excitement and engagement from our students. I had a conversation uh, just a few months ago with a kid that was in one of our vocational schools. He was into the welding program. I asked him, hey, you know, what are you doing here? Why, why, why do you like this? And he said, I like working with my hands and I want to make money. I can't think of a better attitude that we could have among our younger generation than that. There's a skilled labor shortage in this country, and West Virginia can certainly fill the gap. So to your point about being innovative with our educational system, it's creating new pathways. It's not throwing more money. It's changing the way that we think about the future. And I think that's one of the big ways that we can do it. We know right now, to go on just one more minute about this, is that credentialing and micro-credentialing is more sought after now than college diplomas. 
We look at the cybersecurity school that's going in at Marshall right now, the one that we have at Fairmont Senior, the credentialing program that you can go through there and get a certification and go on to work immediately. It doesn't require four years in school. So why don't we take a more targeted approach, look at the jobs that are available in West Virginia, look at the jobs in the 21st century economy that are beginning to come and blossom throughout the country, and let's start to target those and push our kids, if they're interested in that direction, so they can begin to be productive citizens of society as soon as possible. More speaking of kids, the foster care crisis in this state uh, really began to get attention about uh, four years ago. Uh, in earnest, and it's been quiet lately, what with the split of DHHR into three different and unique divisions. Now, I'm not sure that more attention hasn't been paid on how's that split going as opposed to who's looking after the foster kids at this time. Your plan as governor to make sure these kids don't fall through the cracks. Well, I can tell you as a father, uh, some of the stories that you hear about what's going on in the foster care system are, are tragic. And one of the most important things that we need to do while we are continuing some of these investigations that we've seen, especially in what happened in uh, Kanawha County, uh, what we need to be doing um, always is making sure that we're doing an internal review to ensure that nothing like this ever, ever happens again. We know that the foster care crisis is one of the largest looming pieces that's going on right now. It ties into the education of our children. It ties in to our economic uh, prosperity that we're all trying to push towards. But we have to ensure that we're focusing on those kids. I went to a focus group in November uh, in Preston County. We were in Kingwood where we had uh, judges and prosecutors and uh, guardian at litems. We were all talking about abuse and neglect cases. And we know that there's a huge shortage of CPS workers. They're stretched very thin right now. But we've got to ensure that we're putting, you know, the training behind and, and recruiting more CPS workers uh, to get involved. Foster parents in the state of West Virginia are people that need to be supported. We have a lot of great foster parents. We need to make sure that we weed out the ones that, you know, we, the, the bad apples, of course. But we need to encourage the good foster parents to say, Thank you for doing what you're doing and the care that you're giving to the children of West Virginia. But systematically, we need to make sure that we have a good um, process and program in place. And absolutely, that'll be a top priority. And I've spoken a lot with, you know, your uh, your senator, uh, Senator Trump, a good friend. And I know he's been very passionate about that. Final question for more capital, Joe. Yeah, Joe. It, uh, if um, we're hitting our benchmarks uh, reportedly regarding a tax cut again, for the uh, citizens of West Virginia. As governor, should we go full steam ahead with a tax cut or proceed with caution? Well, I'm proud to be the only uh, person running for governor right now that's actually lowered the hardworking people of West Virginia's taxes. I was proud to reduce the tax burden on every single hardworking West Virginia to the tune of $750 million. That was 21% immediately. I was proud also to put triggers in place so that that tax reduction can go to zero. What we're seeing right now with tax collections are we are almost on pace to where we were a year ago on personal income tax collections, and we, we put in a 21% cut. So what does that tell us? That, tell us that, our, that tells us that our economy is growing. As your governor, I can guarantee you that we will work to accelerate those metrics so that we can get it to zero as quickly as possible. Okay. Okay. Right, more final word is yours before we hit the road. Well, I appreciate you having me on, Rob. I always like being here. It's great to be in the Panhandle, exciting part of uh, of West Virginia growth. I saw uh, the report from uh, Dr. Deskins the other day that he gave to the chamber. Uh, it's encouraging to see what's going on. Obviously, we're all taking notes of uh, how the uh, economic prosperity is going so well here. We're going to bring that to the rest of the state. I can tell you, I'm running this campaign exactly like I'll run my administration. And that is out in West Virginia with West Virginians. And as a West Virginian, I'm for West Virginia. And we've done 60 to 70,000 miles on this campaign. And we'll do much more. And I'm looking forward to seeing everybody out there. How Go to morecapito.com. Visit us. Check us out. We look forward to seeing you. That answered my last question. How do people find out more about your campaign? More about more at morecapito.com. As I said, you answered my last question. More in 24. <laughs> Should I keep going? <laughs> good job. That's good stuff. Yeah, more, thank you. Hey, thanks, Rob. Good, good to, to be with you. you.